Hey everybody. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking um, mostly about the first acronym. So I'm going to be talking about JSON Web Tokens. So I have to say up front that if any of you came here tonight mainly because of the two second acronyms, bummer, like this is the time to probably say, okay, I, I went to the wrong meetup because I'm mainly going to be talking about JSON Web Tokens and how you can use them to glue together uh, different APIs. Uh, and possibly build apps with, with, with a new kind of, of architecture. A um, little bit about who I am. Uh, I'm Matt Billman. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Netlify. And at Netlify, we are, we are building like a unifying platform that makes it as easy as one click to deploy any modern Jamstack app uh, to a CDN. Um, so this talk is kind of about Glue. Um, glue is awesome, right? You can put all kinds of things together uh, and make new things in that way. Um, but it's sometimes I learned over my time important to figure out what you should put together and what you shouldn't put together. So let's talk about like what it is JSON Web Tokens can be used for and, and what it is they can be used to glue together and why you would even glue together things. Um, before I talk about that, I'll jump like really far back in time to like brief history of, of, of what brought us here. So a long time ago uh, in the beginning, there was the Unix terminal and we had this um, client server model where people would have like a very dumb little terminal simply because computers were not that advanced at that time. They would log into a big uh, Unix server and do time sharing and so on, and the server would run everything for them. They would just send back a little bit of text and get back a nice text from the server. Uh, and, and, and that was nice until, um, yeah, like that, that was like the, the start of this whole client server model, right? Like with a thin client and, and a really big server for the time. Like today, the server would fit in a, in a USB stick or something like that, right? But back then, they were big. Um, then we got sort of the next step of, of the fat clients because we started wanted like much, much more interactive applications that could show more graphics and do more things. And at that time that the server couldn't push that back and forth, you were probably connecting with a modem or something like that, right? So we got this concept of a really fat client that would run a big desktop application and then talk to a server somewhere and, and send back and forth data and the server would be much thinner in a way, and you would have a much heavier client that did much more of the work. Um, that sort of lasted um, until the web came, saw, and conquered, and started taking over everything. Uh, and we started moving to this uh, typical model of, of, the, of the dynamic web app, like WordPress, Rails uh, are, are the typical examples of, of this kind of, of architecture where the where we went back to a really thin client in a way, right? Like the browser at the time was was mostly just a document viewer. It would get some HTML from a server and show it, right? And you would follow link around, but but most of the stuff would happen on a server that would run some program, talk to a database, and then send back the HTML for the next screen in your application. And 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 you would like we had this swing away from the from the rich client until Ajax started happening and uh, people found out that they didn't have to reload the whole page every time and it started opening up the possibility of new ways of doing things. We started beginning to have this concept of a web API that instead of returning a whole document or a whole application, it would just send back data and then the application could talk to that. So we got like into the age of the single page app, uh, like all these platforms for, for building to-do lists especially. Um, that 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 really took this concept of like okay we have a browser it actually runs a whole program it's kind of like a fat client again and then it talks to an API um, and that's like one simple model where where we have like okay we have our API we have our client and the single page app in the client talks to the API and it's all fine but what we've seen happening is that instead of having one of these APIs that you talk to, we're starting to have this whole API economy with all kinds of different things, right? And you put up an application and it talks maybe to Stripe and it talks maybe to Discuss and it talks maybe to Twitter's API and Facebook's API, right? And group all these things together. And that has led us to like rethink maybe the, 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 the stack where instead of thinking, okay, 
one client talking to one API. We're talking now just about like shipping some markup to the browser that loads some JavaScript that talks to a lot of different APIs. So we get this Jamstack architecture, right, where you have like a site that does that no longer talks to to one API, but that starts talking to all kinds of different APIs. Um, and often these APIs get much smaller in scope. So we start talking about microservices instead of APIs. We start start talking about little targeted services that does one thing or another. And we're starting to move from from the old client and a server to this idea of a client and a lot of small microservices that they can be cloud function or they can be individual APIs, they can be an AWS Lambda or they can run in Heroku or they can be something that someone already provides uh, that, that, that you just plug into. Um, but it's a very different architecture than this idea of like, okay, we have our server, we have our API. And it's also a very different architecture of the traditional monolithic app where like this, this just serves everything. Now, once we start having that architecture, we start having the problem of all these little APIs. How do they even know that they should be talking to us? Right. So we have our, our site there, and, and, and I start sending a request to one API and to another API and asking for things and doing things. And you very quickly, if you build anything with this kind of architecture, run into the problem of how, how do all those APIs know who's talking to them? Yeah, and how do they know whether this guy or this girl has permissions to do something, right? Um, if, if you've been doing this for a while, you've probably seen this solution built. Uh, I've seen it built. <laughs> I've built a couple, right, where, where, where you sort of make the first answers to say, okay, then we have this one more API. It's like this big authentication API. Now all our APIs sort of can talk to that one uh, to figure out who's the user, right? So a request comes in, we get some token. Our little API asks the authentication API, who's this guy, and is that guy locked in right now, and so on, and gets data back. And of course that works, but it brings very tight coupling, right? Like suddenly all of these APIs actually need to know about that authentication API, and they need to agree that this is our authentication API and they need to all talk to that one and be built around that one essentially. Um, it also introduces a single point, point of failure where if your authentication API is unreliable for, for a little, like it becomes like the bottleneck, right? Everything depends on how reliable is that authentication API because every single request that requires some kind of authentication needs to talk to it. And it's bad for performance, right? Every single request needs to go through a request to one of these APIs, and then it needs to ask the authentication API, hey, is this guy allowed to do something, right? Is this token valid? Is, is, this, is this a valid request? So that's sort of the, 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 the problem of, of, of wanting to build like this system of microservices. How, how, do, they, how do they know who, who you are? And that's where the JSON Web Tokens uh, comes and, and at least attempts to rescue the day. Uh, so JSON Web Tokens were invented uh, by Auth0. Um, and they made it an, 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 uh, a request for comments, uh, an open standard um, around, uh, uh, around this format called uh, JSON Web Tokens. Uh, Auth0 is, is if any of you don't know it, it's an authentication API in itself. So sort of related to solving this issue, but in a very different way. Uh, and we'll see how uh, afterwards. Um, so what is this, this JSON web token that they, that they introduced as an attempt to solve this? A JSON web token is, is basically just a string, right? So don't, don't uh, ascribe it more superpowers than it has. Um, it's a string that's formatted like this, has a header, a dot, a payload, a dot, and a signature. Um, so it's a pretty, it's, it's a pretty straightforward uh, format, but the important part is, is, is the functions of each of those uh, three parts of the token. Um, so the people from Alcero made this uh, really nice utility at jvt.io where you can go in and play with these strings. So this here is, is, is a token. And we'll see it has this red part that's the header, 
the purple part that's the payload and the blue part here that's the that's the signature in the header has tends to always have have a type jwt i've never seen that type be anything else so it's not the most important part of the token um, what is important is is this little alg the algorithm that says that that this token uh, is signed with this um, encryption algorithm, then it has some kind of payload, right? Uh, the payload is basically just a JSON document with, with different claims they're called, right? But it's basically just a JSON object um, encoded into a string. Each of these are turned into base64 just to make sure that you can pass them around and that they can be in URLs or in headers or anywhere. Um, so the first part when you're reading a JSON web token is just to unencode it and unwrap it and, and be able to look at it like this. And then there's this really important part that's the signature. And that's basically just taking this header part and this payload part and then signing it with this encryption algorithm and a secret key. Um, and appending that to the final token. Now, what's important here is that if you send me this token and I happen to know the same secret that you used to sign that token with, and that we suppose that that is really a secret, right? So it's only, only the two of us that knows it. I can use that secret to verify that you really meant it when you said that the current user has this subscription ID, the name is John Doe, and, and, uh, and he's an admin. So um, when we go back, and let me see if I can find my cursor in my slides again. When we go back to this, um, to this problem of the many small APIs that needs to know who, who's talking to them, does the person talking to them have the right permissions? Um, we can use this little JSON web token as a form of stateless authentication, where they, as long as each of these little APIs know the secret that this token is supposed to be signed with, they can decode the token, look at that JSON payload, verify that the secret uh, generates the right, right signature, and then they can be sure that whoever issued that token with the same secret actually meant that, hey, the user is who he claims to be. Uh, the token here uh, can include like information about the role of the user. Uh, does this user have access to this specific API? Uh, it can also include some display data. Uh, you'll often see these tokens include like the display name and so on. So if you have APIs that need to, apart from like, let's say you have an e-commerce API and you need to buy a, an order for some specific user, uh, the API can, can use that display name to send an invoice with the right name without ever having to talk to some centralized API. So you get a model that looks like this instead, where you have a little ALF API that knows how to issue these uh, these tokens, right? And these tokens, again, they're, they're standard, uh, they're, they're in a paper, and, and then you have all these other APIs that doesn't have to know anything about the existing of the of the ALF API. They don't know need to know if it's ALF0, if it's your own little service, if it's Storekeeper in a Rails app, whatever. They just need to know the secret that the API is using to sign these tokens with, so they can verify that the tokens are right. And then in all, Every time we talk from our browser with one of these little APIs, we can pass that token along in the API, can just look at that token. It doesn't have to ask the ALF API, what's the name of this user? It can just look at the token and see, okay, the token says that this is the name of this user. Um, the token says that this user has the role of uh, an e-commerce admin or whatever, and then do, uh, do the right action. Um, so in case that's like very abstract, <laughs> I'm going to actually um, show this in, in, in action. Off screen mirroring so I can see what I do here. <laughs> Always high risk. Good. <laughs> 
don't tell people <laughs> this, this is a this is a project we're we we're, we're helping out a little with so we have a lot of insight into how it's getting built and and it's um it's it's a new version of of a popular online magazine um that um that has a bunch of different functionalities so obviously it has like a, a a website that's built completely statically. It's generated by static site generator, pushes out thousands of pages, and 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 then it's deployed. But it also has features like um, like authentication, right? So this is the part that talks to a tiny little uh, API, and I'll show you like all of the APIs that 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 this site uses are, are small open source APIs that uh, that that anybody can 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 use. Um, the the most important for for this demo is obviously the the little API that actually issues these JSON web tokens. So if I go here and type my secret password, that fortunately is not so secret because it's just my local account. Uh, because oops, yeah, let me just persist the log so we can see what actually goes on. So when I do this login, yeah, let me just first find the right URL and then I'll zoom in a lot. Here we have the initial request that sets uh, that that just sends an OAuth um, login request with a grant type of, of password. It's passive. It, this is part of like the OAuth two standard, but it could be any kind of OAuth login. This kind in this case, it uses the grant type that's called password, which just sends the username and the password to an authentication service, um, which replies. Yeah, we are not getting the reply here. So so let's just see what it sends. get the right port. Okay. So here, this little service will send back um, one of these JSON web tokens that will identify me to all the other small parts of this app that I'm talking with. Um, you will always, when you use this, um, when you use JVTs, you'll always want to use what's called a refresh token in OAuth. So that means you always want to issue a JVT. And we can go again to um, that page jvt.io, take this token, put it into the debugger and see exactly what's in it. So in this case, we'll see that there's some app metadata that says that I'm an admin. So from now on, all the APIs I talk to will know, OK, this is actually an admin. We should treat him specially. Um, has my email. It has an expiration time that says that this web token is only valid until this time. Um, that's important because when you do this stateless authentication, normally if you had that centralized API that all the other APIs would almost always ask, like, is this is this person allowed? That central API can also easily sign out, sign out a person or disallow a person. Once you have this stateless authentication, you rely more on having each token have a fairly short lifetime. 
and then and then have this authentication API where every time a token expires, the user of that token needs to ask for a new one because that one that that way once the user is no longer allowed uh, to access, you just disable it on the main service. Um, and then you can see there's some user metadata here that, that the different parts of, of the app uses to, to display my name. Um, so if we go back here and see, we can see that it's obviously using this data from the token to say, hello, Matthias, and so on. And it means that if I move around on different parts of this site that needs to know my name, it doesn't need to constantly ask some API, like, what's the name of this guy? It just, it just checks the token, right? Um, if I go here, and check my orders, I'll see like an order history. So this is because um, the application is talking to a completely different little API that handles uh, e-commerce for static sites. And obviously I've, I've been testing this a lot, so I've been buying some stuff. Um, and when I go here, we'll see again that it does a get request and it uses the JVT token as you would use any uh, OAuth 2 token. So in the request to this little e-commerce API, it's also just running on my local host uh, on another port. Um, it's sending along a bearer token. That's just the JSON web token. And then again, this, this, this little API managing e-commerce can look at that and say, OK, this is from the user with the user ID that's encoded in the token uh, as an ID here. And then show all the orders made with that user ID. So again, we have this completely separate, um, two completely separate APIs that's glued together just by these JSON web tokens. And I could go and change the whole login API to use our zero tomorrow. And I wouldn't need to tell the e-commerce API about it, right? It, it would just get the JSON web tokens from, from somewhere else. Uh, and obviously the, the alpha API doesn't need to know that there exists any other API that this e-commerce API is, is there and depends on its tokens. It just needs to have a way to, 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 to issue those. Um, and um, you can easily imagine how once we have that standard and, and we really start using it, how we can start building out a, a sort of an ecosystem of small reusable pieces that, that we can tie together and glue together into really interesting constructs by way of this JSON web tokens without any tight coupling between them uh, and, um, and, and with a much higher reusability factor than, than if, you're e if you build a Rails e-commerce that also includes login and authentication and all of that, and then you need to combine it with a with, with a site and you need to combine it with a member script plan. And suddenly you need to stuff all of those into the same project just because otherwise, how are, how are they going to communicate with each other? With this approach, we, we can really get to, to, a, to a much better place where we can uh, glue all kinds of interesting services together. And that was my little warm up talk for today. Uh, any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is that is the main requirement, right? That you do need to, they they do need to have a, have a secret, right? But for example, Alpha Zero is a good example. That's a, that's a large multi-tenant API, right? But but as a user of Alpha Zero, you create some app instance and you give that. And, and it will generate you a client and a secret, and then you share that specific secret with, with different API layers, right? Um, so those APIs, you could also easily imagine having a multi-tenant version of, of this e-commerce service or whatever, and you just set up your little app instance and tell you this is the secret, and uh, typically you will support some, some way of rotating secrets and so on. So you can have a couple of secrets in place, and it will try both of them uh, and so on. Yeah, you need you, you need some kind of, of authentication API, right? In in our case, it's this uh, it's this API that I have running here on on localhost 999, right? Um, it could also be um, again our our zero. Um, whenever you whenever you do a login with without zero, 
um, I think their own page will look right. It will give you this kind of pop up and it will let you authenticate with any of these services. And then in the end, once you're done authenticating, it will give the application a JSON web token back. Right? But the difference is that, that it's just the client that needs to get that identity, right? So you can have this rich client that talks to a lot of different APIs. And that client, of course, needs to, to, to decide on some issuer of these JSON web tokens. But, but then all the rest of the ecosystem doesn't need to care about that, that one issuer. Okay, if you go back to, let me see. You can go back to this model. Yeah, I think it actually disappeared when I stopped screen mirroring because fuck. <laughs> so if you could go back to this model, right? Um, it's a very big difference from from this model, whoops. Sorry. <laughs> Stupid arrows. Yeah, it's very different from, from this model where all these APIs depend on this authentication API and all these APIs need to be very tightly coupled. They need to know that there is this one. From, from, from the model where you just have the client needs to know about that ALP API, but all the other APIs are completely decoupled from that knowledge. How do they? The secret. You, when you configure them, you give them the secret, right? Oh. Yeah, I mean, each of those need to have the secret, right? It's secret. So when, when, you, when you set this up, you need to share the secret with them, right? Um, initially, because they, 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 you know, they, they need to know that that this secret is 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 part of one app, right? Um, so we always have to 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 install some kind of secret in them. Otherwise, they don't have a way to 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 guarantee the validity of the token. But that's a much that's a much lesser coupling, right? Like because it's not a runtime coupling of any way, right? Like you just need to configure them with that secret. Um, you, you, you share with those, right? You, you, you expect the APIs to be trusted in this case. Yeah. 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 You will. You, you might still, I think what we're starting to see around that kind of thing is these API gateways that then you can use to, to for example, like I, I do have another example of this, which is uh, an, an open source project we're, we're building called Netlify CMS, um, which is like a content management system for, for um, essentially any site built with a, a site generator like Hugo or Jekyll or Hexo or any of those, right? Um, the way the CMS works is just that um, that it talks directly to, to to GitHub, right? So you tell it a bit about your content model, and then instead of you having like a database of content and then building the site from that, you just have your repository. And with Netlify, we, we normally always have this flow where you link a repository to a URL. Whenever you update the repository, we'll run your build tool of choice and push the result to a CDN. So once you have the CMS layer that, that sits on top of that and just edits the content directly in GitHub, every time someone does an edit, we do a commit in GitHub, it triggers a new build and a new version of the site goes live. But there we have sort of the same problem, right? Like how, how do we give access to GitHub without requiring all the users of the CMS to uh, have their own GitHub account or to use our 
global GitHub token, which we don't want to give them, right? Um, so there we have, um, and let me just show the URL. Um, you go here, you can find all the projects I've, I've talked about. We have a little project, uh, it's just called Nellify Proxy, uh, API Proxy. And it's essentially a, a, a tiny uh, micro uh, API gateway that will let you set up a little API gateway, specify some APIs, specify what parts of them you want to grant access to anyway, and then say, I only want to grant access to this API to anyone with a valid token that has the role uh, CMS, for example, right? And that way we can give scoped access to part of GitHub's API by sending all the requests through this little API proxy. And it will verify the token and we'll see does the user have a valid token and does the user have the role CMS or the role admin? And if he does, then give this access to, to, to GitHub's API, right? So I think that's that's what we'll see. And of course, we, we like uh, today, AWS just announced that their marketplace around the API gateway, right? I think there's a lot of, a lot of ways to, to put these sort of gatekeepers in place um, to overcome those challenges of what do we do with the external APIs that, that, that has a different secret and a different uh, way of sharing. It depends a bit. Like often, the, the typical solution in general for for OAuth tokens in um, in single page app is local storage, um, that, and that's typically the best option. You can you can sometimes give people an option to remember we are not, and then either store it in local storage, store it in memory, or store it in uh, session storage, which will go away as soon as you close the tab, depending on how sensitive it is. And then again, it's it's a refresh token, right? So you will have to have in your client that logic of when the token is marked as expired, do a refresh and get a new one back. Um, yeah, yeah. And I remember that that Yahoo in the beginning actually built like the the centralized uh, Alp API that everything would would talk to and get all the information to. And then I think they've they've also move towards similar similar setup. Sorry? How is um, that Yeah, it's, it typically uses HMAC and just specifies what algorithm uh, to, to use. So in that way, it's just a wrapper around. Okay, thank you.